Hello there, good evening. Welcome to Look North, our top story tonight. The mother travelling eight hours to visit her teenage daughter being treated for an eating disorder due to a lack of specialist beds locally. In her eyes, and I totally get this, she is abandoned and she is abandoned, you know, she's so far away from, from home, she's so far away from her friends, her family. That's despite a government commitment to end the practice three years ago. Also tonight... The Sheffield School Bus Company is being driven around the bend by Clean Air Zone Red Tape. Britain's best loaf, the Derbyshire for Catcher, that's winning national awards. And I'm in a back garden in Gawthorpe near Osset with the community's newest neighbour. The peacock looks beautiful, but the problem is it's keeping the whole... <gasps> that shocked me, it was so loud! And despite the fact there's been a lot of cloud again today, there's been a bit of brightness developing over the last few hours. But what about the next few days? Join me for the detailed forecast. Hello there, I hope you've had a lovely day. Welcome to Wednesday's programme. Two mothers from North Yorkshire have told Look North they feel let down as their teenage daughters have been sent to specialist hospitals miles from their home to be treated for an eating disorder. It's meant a return journey of up to eight hours to visit their very sick children. The latest NHS data shows there's been a big rise in the past year in the number of days children have been treated away from their families. That's despite a promise by the government to stop the practice three years ago. Louise Fuster has our top story. It's upsetting to know that there's nothing nearby. Why isn't there something? Like, I know there is somewhere close to us, but they don't have a place for her. They don't have a place. They don't have the things that, that my daughter needed. Stacey's 14-year-old daughter is in a special hospital. She's getting treatment for an eating disorder. It's an eight-hour round trip from Scarborough to see her. We're not naming her as she's vulnerable. There's no signs currently of, of her getting better and I think because she's so consumed with it, it's literally taken, taken over and I think because of the lack of support and the fact in her eyes, and I totally get this, she is abandoned and she is abandoned, you know, she's so far away from, from home, she's so far away from her friends, her family. Stacey's daughter is in what the NHS itself calls an inappropriate out-of-area placement because of a lack of beds in her local area. How hard has it been to leave her today where she is? It's just awful because you're not going to see her again and you're helpless, there's nothing you can do. You want to scream, just eat, just drink, just get better, but you can't. You've got to just go, OK, see you later, love you. It's awful, it's, it's, it's horrific. Good girl, sweetheart. Meanwhile, in Rydale, 15-year-old Annie loved riding her pony Maddie until she too had an eating disorder. I did a few competitions with her. She used to jump. We got through to this dressage thing, but um, I couldn't go in the end because obviously it won't be well. But then, yeah, she used to be a good little jumper and then she just stopped jumping. And that's when I thought that I was too big for her, so I stopped eating. Last year, she was sent miles away from her family in North Yorkshire to be treated for anorexia. Yeah, when I was parents were there, going every night but I only got to see mine once a week and it was quite hard because I was just sat there on my own. Annie was so poorly and there were no beds locally for her it meant a nationwide search for one. It was hard, it was hard on all of us, it affected our whole family, our whole family dynamics changed, our other children, we travelled backwards and forwards all the time as much as we could to see her. Unfortunately, it took us about two and a half, three hours one way just to get there. And a few of the children that were in the unit, their parents lived closer. So Annie, bless her, didn't, she couldn't understand that. Why don't you come and visit me? They come every night to see their children. And yes, she was right, why didn't we go every night? But it's just too far. In a statement, the government said they are investing an extra £2.3 billion a year in mental health services and increasing capacity at children and young people's community eating disorder services across the country. 
Back in Scarborough, the nightmare is continuing for Stacey as she prepares for another long journey to see her daughter. You'd like to think she's going to come out of it, but the reality is, and it is a harsh reality, is she might not come out of it. And it's awful to think you've brought this child into the world, you know, you've, you've nurtured them, you've, you've made them into who they are, and you don't know whether they're going to pull through. And it is truly horrific for a parent to feel like that. Gosh, it's just heartbreaking, isn't it? That was Stacey there ending the report by Louise Fuster. Dr Ashish Kumar is from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Psychiatrists. I asked him if there was a postcode lottery in terms of providing specialist beds. The inpatient units are situated in certain areas and we need to have a national strategy of how to have access to inpatient care for mental health and children's eating disorder services. Um, we should be located in all the parts of the country, not just in two or three or four locations, which might be the case currently. Mm. We've heard from one mother doing an eight-hour round trip to see her daughter. As she says, her daughter says she feels abandoned. Surely this is counterproductive for the recovery of such a vulnerable young person. Yes, I will agree on that, that uh, eating disorders are very complex uh, mental health condition and uh, they need comprehensive care from mental health providers, the physical health providers such as pediatricians um, and uh, nurses and other specialists. And uh, they, the children need to be closer to their families and friends, but this is not happening if they're transferred to 200 miles or 100 miles away from their family home. And that needs to stop. Otherwise, we are putting the children's mental and physical health at risk. If you or someone you know has been affected by the issues raised in that report, then you can contact BBC Action Line at bbc.co.uk for details of organisations which offer advice and support. Next tonight, coach drivers transporting school children in Sheffield are being driven around the bend by the clean air zone red tape, which they say is unworkable and it's landing them with huge fines. As rules state, they have to give five days notice before any school trip. Heidi Tomlinson has been speaking to some coach companies about the impact it's having on their business. With a fleet of 28 diesel buses, Paul Harrison is adept at navigating Sheffield. Mainly, he takes children to and from school, so when the clean air zone was introduced, charges flooded in. We've probably had 30 odd thousand pound in fines, um, but I've argued every single one and I've only paid four fines you know, up to now. That's because the council have altered the system on three occasions. As it stands, taking children to and from school in commercial vehicles that don't meet emission standards in Sheffield will incur a charge. £10 a day for taxis and minibuses and £50 for a coach. But all school trips are exempt because they're educational. However, coach companies need to apply for the school trip exemption five days in advance, which is causing problems. We had three school trips cancelled, which we'd applied for, got the permission to run the school trips. It was bad weather. You can't expect children to go out on a, a day trip and get soaked through. So now they, they're going to rebook the trips and quite often these trips come in at short notice. For every single school trip made on a minibus like this, the company spends 15 minutes applying for an exemption online. And at this time of year, there can be 40 such journeys a day. Sheffield City Council says it is listening to feedback and is open to making changes where possible. Drivers are due to meet the council next month. There's a list of issues not least inconsistent charges for similar vehicles. You've got this vehicle here, Cyve Echo, which is £50 to second to the clean air zone. Then you've got this vehicle, which is the same as that vehicle, but this is £10 to second to Sheffield clean air zone. And then you've got this vehicle, which is also an Cyve Echo, 16-seater. This is free because it's disabled. Obviously, you can see they're all the same vehicles and they all let the same emissions off, which is really confusing. When you try and get through to Sheffield City Council then to explain why, why is one bus £50, why was £10, they, they've been looking into this for, since November and still have got no answers. Since the clean air zone was introduced last year, Sheffield Council says the number of polluting vehicles has fallen by two-thirds. But school bus drivers are now calling for a blanket exemption to reduce costs and inconvenience. Heidi Tomlinson, BBC Look North, Sheffield. You're watching Wednesday's Look North, still to come on tonight's programme. 
the molten runner hoping to break a three peaks record. Let's take a look at some other stories coming into our newsroom now. A talented dancer from West Yorkshire was unlawfully killed by her boyfriend, who was then found dead the following day, a coroner has ruled. 26-year-old Georgia Brooke was strangled during sex with Luke Cannon at his home in Bradford in February 2022. An inquest at Bradford Coroner's Court was told. Georgia from Osset was found unresponsive by paramedics and pronounced dead in hospital just over an hour later. Her mother told the inquest her daughter's death had left a huge hole in her family's lives. A community in York says it's in a race against time to buy a piece of land thought to be a site where a Roman emperor was killed. The former reservoir near Holgate in the city has been fenced off for many years now and it's a thriving wildlife habitat. The landowner though says it no longer has a use and it's earmarked for a private sale. A crowdfunding appeal needs to raise £168,000 by the end of June as Phil Bobmer reports. It's known locally as the Emperor's View, a place where Septimius Severus is believed to have been cremated in Roman York back in 211 AD. Today, nearly two millennia on, it's a little green island in a sea of grey suburbia. Because a lot of the ice came from the dales into the vale. Now, campaigners are in a race to buy this natural habitat, which is up for sale, amid fears its legacy could be lost to development. It has a, a historic value from this Roman connection with the Emperor Septimius Severus, but it has this really interesting natural history story, both a present-day one, in the, over the last few decades since the site has stopped being used as a reservoir, it has essentially rewilded itself. So nature has just returned because people aren't allowed on the site, and it's just done what it, what it does, and nature has just you know, evolved or, or you know, made use of this space. Um, and what's particularly interesting is that it's a hill so the great, so the, the nature that's taken up here is, is sort of is forming a, a habitat on a really interesting spot because that actually harks back to the Ice Age. The Friends of Severus Hill, a local community group, have set up a crowdfunding appeal to raise £168,000 to buy the four-acre site. We're at a point of two crises in some ways. There's a housing crisis and there's a, a biodiversity crisis. And the question is, with all these sites, which way do you go? We're aware that housing is important. Within you know, a two minute walk, we've got York Central being developed. And you've got to ask the question of which spaces are to be developed and which are not. What has happened on this site with the rewilding is absolutely incredible. You know, nature has done the work and, and we, re we wrecked this, this space you know, through industry. Nature has rewilded it. So saving it for that purpose, for its biodiversity, uh, you know, for its impact on the community environmentally, is huge. In a statement, Keyland Development said it's agreed to sell our entire interest in the site to the local group at cost and have given them time to raise the funds. We've signed an exclusivity agreement with the community group that runs to the end of July 2024. And during that time, we won't discuss the site with any other party. We wish them well with the fundraising activities. Long since used by people, Severus Hill has been taken over by Mother Nature. Now it's about preserving its past and conserving its future. Phil Bottmer, BBC Look North, York. Let's hope they can do it, eh? Former footballer and TV pundit Chris Kamara has been awarded the freedom of the city of Wakefield. It's in recognition of his services to charity and the city. Chris has apraxia, a neurological disorder which affects his speech. He played for Leeds United, Sheffield United and Bradford City, who he also managed and has lived in Wakey for 34 years. At today's Freedom of the City ceremony, he was described as a national treasure. It was definitely emotional because I don't feel I'm worthy of something like this. When you get involved in doing stuff for charity, you do it out of the goodness of your heart, not for awards later on down the line. So I can only say thank you to Wakefield. Unbelievable, I have to say. But Chris Kamara is so special. It was wonderful for him and his family today. And he absolutely deserved it, so enjoy the moment, Chris. 
Now, a runner from Moulton has started a record-breaking attempt to become the fastest person to complete the National Three Peaks Challenge. 24-year-old Imogen Bodie from Moulton is running 422 miles over the UK's highest mountains, Ben Nevis in Scotland, Scarfell Pike in Cumbria and Snowdon in Wales. Now, the previous record from sea level to sea level is seven days and 31 minutes, and it was set right back in 1979. Nicola Reese caught up with Imo before she set off. So you'll have to run 100 kilometers every day for seven days. Can you do it? I can do it, Chris, I can do it. Yes, you can. <laughs> At this stage, it's all about the positive attitude. Imo Bodies set her sights on a British fell running record. She wants to be the fastest to complete the National Three Peaks Challenge. Yes, yeah, a huge challenge. I've trained unbelievably hard and I feel ready, but I'm nervous. I think our biggest challenge is actually probably going to be Scarfell Pike, because um, that's the point where you're you know, four and a half days in at this stage, so very fatigued. Coach Chris is in charge of logistics. For months now, he's had Imo running 100 miles a week. Quick hill sprint. <laughs> go on then, go. All the hard work physically has been done, so now it's just keeping Imo nice and calm and controlled. Uh, when we've been out training in you know, six inches of snow up in Ben Nevis, now it's just about ignoring the things we can't control, remembering all the hard work that she's put in, and then just being ready to go when it's time. Yeah, three big mountains. So starting sea level, hiking a big mountain, running to the next, hiking another mountain, and then running to the next. 420 miles, or 16 marathons back to back. She'll have to reach the top of Ben Nevis in Scotland, Scarfell Pike in Cumbria, and Snowdon in Wales. Do you recognise that gate? Yeah, I was going to say, I recognise yeah. that gate when I saw that. It's just past Cameron House, isn't it? The current record stands at seven days and 31 minutes. It was set in 1979 by British race walker and sayer. Don't underestimate how fast that woman could walk. She could walk at five miles an hour and took only a 15 minute break in a 14 hour day of walking. I think she's an inspiration and it's going to be hopefully a very cool thing to break. This was the support crew back then. Today it's much the same. Imo's mum and dad will be on hand with food and dry clothes. I think I'll be making lots of these. Well, she's certainly very headstrong, isn't she? Exactly. Certainly, certainly yeah. very headstrong, yeah. very determined. When she's running, she'll have a tracker on her, so, so we'll be following the tracker. Um, we will stop every 10 kilometres, and so we will be at those designated spots every time um, with all the refreshments and, and um, whatever's Change required. Change of clothing, yeah. Socks. yeah. I've trained unbelievably hard and I've done a lot of practice with nutrition and hydration, but it's going to be unbelievably tough, so it's definitely not going to be easy. I have absolute faith that she will beat this record, but make no mistake, it will take every ounce of her strength, both mental and physical. Imo has form. Two years ago, she ran the length of the UK, becoming the youngest female to complete the challenge. This time, though, she's aiming higher. Three peaks, world record. Here I come. Nicola Reese. BBC Look North, Moulton. I have no doubt you will smash it, Imo. If you like dot watching, then there's a live tracker online where you can follow her progress. She's currently 12 miles into her challenge, so Ben Nevis is already in the bag and she is still going strong. Best of luck, what an incredible challenge. Now, who is feeling hungry? It's definitely my dinner time. We have here officially Britain's best loaf of bread. This focaccia is baked in Staverley and has been recognised at a top awards ceremony. Even better, it was only developed after a mistake with the usual recipe. Now, while Tom Ingle introduces you to the baker who put the art into Artisan, I'm going to tuck in. Meet a man whose stock and dough is rising. Tom Martin from North Derbyshire has been a baker, man and boy. I want to try and maintain the heritage of how bread should be made and, and not sort of using heavy, heavy machinery to, to produce it, just a very basic setup, just a table, a mixing bowl and an oven, um, and just maintaining that, uh, that way of life, really, and of how it's been done for, for thousands of years. But accidents happen. No, I'm not talking about me, but rather Tom's award-winning bread. So the first thing we do is we start to top the uh, focaccia with all the lovely ingredients that we use um, in the competition. You see, 
it was developed following a mistake. So I accidentally put too much water into my sourdough mix one day um, and we couldn't use it for, for sourdough. We put it into a tray, put a bit of oil over it, a bit of salt um, and then put it in the oven. So I prayed to the bakery gods and, uh, and, and we got a result. Generous sprinkle. Uh, I usually my measurements are just by two, two, my two hands. It's very precise, I yeah. can see that. And then we sprinkle it, again, just a nice even covering all over. Look, you, you've missed a bit, sorry. Just a little bit, stick yeah, it in. There's, yeah. So now we're going to actually go into the dough. Um, Ooh, we're going to get our hands so sticky. going to be really dirty. All right. And oily and smelly. Um, this is what I came to work for. Ooh, oh, oh. <laughs> bit quicker, bit quicker. Oh, oh, sorry, oh. All the way through, all the way through. Oh, I'm going, I'm pressing the tray. Oh, look, see, I've got bubbles. Yeah, you've got bubbles. It's like bubble wrap. And then so, what else? So where you, so where yeah. you way yes. back down on the side, that's it. Mm, mm, mm. Safe to say, if I'd been in the kitchen in ancient Mesopotamia, the human race would have died out. Oh, it's already sizzling. And I am pleased to reveal that Britain's Best Loaf 2024 is the Garlic and Rosemary Deep Pan Focaccia by Four Eyes Bakery. While we wait, here's the moment a couple of weeks back, Tom's Loaf was crowned Britain's Best. He and his wife, Emily, now serve around 120 customers in local eateries. They share the bakery with a patisserie, also all about the handcraft. So that one's yours. So that one's mine. And that one's mine. Oh, look at that. Go on, then, the moment of truth. It's a bit pale compared to yours. Yeah, it's just perhaps just, yeah, maybe not as many air bubbles in it. You can hear that crunch on the top, which we've got a nice crust. Oh, and look at that lovely steam coming out. And then you've got all the steam in there. And, uh... Magic. OK, it's coming your way. Bon appetit. Tom, it's absolutely delicious. I do hope you've washed your hands, cos I've just watched you massage that dough. But it's absolutely gorgeous. And this has been in the office for four hours. It's still gorgeous and moist. Hudson's got no chance. It's mine. <laughs> now, finally tonight, residents in a sleepy market town in West Yorkshire are being disturbed night and day by the screeching of a runaway peacock. Take a listen to this. Oh my gosh, that's so annoying, isn't it? Imagine if you heard that when you went to bed, when you woke up in the morning, there has been a concerted effort in Osset to try and capture this bird that's been terrorising the neighbourhood for the past four days. Olivia Richwald has been sent in, has sent in this report. Welcome to Peacock Street in Gawthorpe. Of course, the street isn't really called Peacock Street, it's actually Wood Street. And it's here that a peacock has taken up residence for a while now, and it's causing untold problems for the people that live here. Apparently, it squawks all night long and it's keeping people up. Well, earlier we arrived to try and see the culprit, and it wasn't hard to locate it because there was a crowd outside the garden and we were invited in to have a look at this peacock merrily sunning itself on top of a shed not making any noise at all it was looking really peaceful and quiet and then of course suddenly it squawks makes you jump out of your skin because it does is incredibly loud let's talk to some of the people who, who are living on this estate in Gawthorpe to find out how it's been affecting them first of all Harry um how annoying is this peacock it is quite annoying I can hear it like all night long and it's like ridiculously loud, but it's not been too bad for me, but I know for a lot of people it's been a pain. And Connie, how's it affected you today? Um, I wasn't able to go to school this morning as I struggled to wake up properly and I only had like an hour of sleep because of its squawking. And um, earplugs, have you tried anything like no. that? No. <laughs> OK, let's talk to um, your mum. Um, Terry, it sounds like, you know, really funny, doesn't it, to have a peacock terrorising yeah. the street. Is it funny? No, it's not funny at all. No. All, all the neighbours, they've, they've all been, like, upset because no-one's getting any sleep, everyone's up for work, we all work, like, different hours, and it's, it's like, crying all night, squawking. <clears throat> um, yeah, I've been to work this morning and so tired on, like, lack of sleep. I've contacted RSPB, um, they couldn't do anything because it wasn't in distress. Um, I also contacted RSPCA and they said until it come to ground level, we couldn't do anything about it. 
as you can hear, it's still on the loose. <laughs> it's elusive, isn't it? Well, it's, it's clearly causing quite a lot of problems here and, and quite a lot of interest as well. And uh, the RSPB advice is definitely not to feed these peacocks and to try gently shooing them away. Let them know they're unwelcome and perhaps they'll move on and find somewhere else to go. Well, while we've been here, this peacock has moved between a few gardens and everyone says that come eight o'clock, that's when it really gets noisy. <laughs> Back to you in the studio. So earplugs from 8pm, or I might put mine on now. Oh, thank shoo, you shoo, very much. Shoo, it, shoo. it sounds a bit of a nightmare, that, doesn't it? Couldn't it's not a laughing matter, you know, Paul. Put the cat on the roof, that'll soon sort, sort the Actually, peacock out. Right, so let me show you a couple of pictures that you've sent in, because brightness has been at a premium. So I've selected this one from yesterday, which is absolutely stunning. That's uh, close to Otley Shevig. And despite the fact that there's been a lot of cloud, it has brightened a bit. That's encouraged a few big clouds to uh, develop. In fact, there's been some very big thunderstorms across the Peak District and reports of a little bit of localised flooding in the Hebden Bridge area. If you've got any pictures you want to send in to me, the addresses are on your screen right now. So the headline tomorrow is a really complicated one. There is a lot of uncertainty about the forecast tomorrow. There will be potentially some heavy rain in places, more especially across southern parts of the region with the best of any drier and brighter weather on offer further north across North Yorkshire. Let me explain what's happening in a moment. There's your headline. Tomorrow's chart's really messy, but it's this weak weather front that could pep up with its activity through tomorrow, certainly threatening southern parts of our region. And then what you also probably won't notice is this little nose of high pressure just in time for the weekend. So the weekend does look quite a bit better. A lot of fine weather, mist and fog at first, but brightening up into the afternoon. And early next week should be largely fine too. Right, there's the, uh, the weak weather front that's causing all the problems. It is very weak at the moment, apart from a clump of heavy downpours across the Peak District. They will fizzle out and then for a time overnight it's fairly quiet. Some mist and patchy fog in places before we see some rain just coming into Lincolnshire, perhaps parts of South Yorkshire later. Lowest temperatures around 10 or 11 degrees. Tomorrow's high water times in Scarborough at 11.31, Filey at 11.37. So tomorrow's forecast does bring an area of quite heavy rain into Derbyshire, South Yorkshire, perhaps West Yorkshire to the north after a grey start it becomes drier and brighter. But I have to say, the northern boundary of this could be 50 miles to the north or 50 miles to the south. But as you can see, if you catch it, there could be some really heavy stuff leading to some localised flooding. So stay tuned with your updated forecast in the next few hours. Highs of 18 degrees, that's the forecast. Come on, I know oh, much I'd, you like a freebie. I'd love some of that. Just don't feed it to the peacocks. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> feed the whole newsroom, man. Uh... That's it from us. I'm back with the late news. Oh, you don't take it all. Good night. <laughs> <I'm crushed. laughs>